kind of a challenge I would have to anybody who watches the Is Genesis History movie. When one side presents their argument, it sounds compelling mm -hmm. until somebody comes and cross-examines them. Mm -hmm. It was time for Dell to move on from Dr. Carter's marine world of ugly sea urchins and cucumbers and find creatures more appealing, more fuzzy. As Todd Wood and I walked through the zoo, we saw incredible beauty and amazing design wherever we looked. As a biologist, what do you see when you see all of these creatures? As always, it's nice to have a little background on Dell's PhD guests. Dr. Charles Todd Wood is a graduate of Liberty University, which has gained some fame of late by having President Trump give the commencement address there. But in our circles, Liberty University is well known for being one of the only places on Earth you can earn a biology degree in young Earth creationism. Being an outsider is fine. Embrace the label. Now, Todd has secular peer review under his belt as well, including a well-cited paper on the genome of rice. But he's become best known as Dr. Barmanology, an unofficial title that probably got him into the film. Yeah, when I look at this, look at these lions specifically, I'm seeing cats myself. And all the other cats they have here at the zoo, they all have this underlying catness to them uh, that's really apparent. They're just like a cat. They look like a cat. <laughs> you know, scientists would put that into a family called Felidae. And I would understand the felids to be representatives of a single created kind. So the continuity, the similarity there is so significant that I'd say, yeah, these guys have all descended from a single pair of critters hmm. that was on the ark and that eventually generated all the different sorts of cats that we have today an underlying catness that's really apparent what unit of measurement do you suppose we use for apparency are we talking like 130 apparenticeters of catness that's not very scientific language for someone who's adopted and intended to sound like science title like barominology I tried to find footage of Todd explaining the concept with his own words, so as not to misrepresent. But the closest was Dennis Wirt presenting one of Todd's papers, using direct quotes from Todd. We're going to use a paper by Mr. Barmanology, Dr. Charles Todd Wood. What is Barmanology? Uh, why did it come about? Uh, where did it start? Barman, 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 where have I heard that before? A comic book. It stars Jimmy Halpert, a mild-mannered paper salesman who, while riding his bike through the forest, is bitten by a radioactive bear. Becomes a bear man. Bear man. Wreaks havoc on the office. It's really good. Cool. But probably unrelated. Pity. Carry on. The idea of a barman, that word barman, comes from the word bara, which means the create, and min means kind. It was a term that was first created for the created kind. It was based on a very basic kind of uh, a priori assumption, and that is that biological organisms were created in their kinds by God in the creation week. And then afterwards, they diverse, diversified very, very quickly over a short period of time, interrupted by a catastrophe known as Noah's flood. So give me some other examples of created kinds. Yeah, so you've got the grizzlies and the polar bear. Those are all members of the bear kind. You've got ducks, swans, and geese. Why does any discussion of created kinds feel like an episode of Sesame Street? Are we playing one of these things as not like the other? And now it's time to play our game. It's time to play our game. Better than examples, could you perhaps define created kind? In terms of definitional ambiguity paired with frequency of use, created kind is right up there with mind and spirit and soul. According to Answers in Genesis, Despite all this variety, it's easy to see which of these belong in the same group. Modern scientists call each of these groups families. But then they walk this back, saying, There's no reason to assume a one-to-one -one correspondence between our man-made system and the biblical terminology, so kind may be at a higher taxonomic level in some cases and lower in others. So higher, lower, or the same. That's a pretty useless definition. The Institute for Creation Research admits they don't have one either, but asks that its supporters pray for future presuppositional research inquiry into the definition of the biblical term kind. It's almost like creationists don't want their word to mean anything. What does Todd say? An unambiguous criteria for what a barman is would be, make research a lot easier. Right. Because of these problems, creation biologists today approximate the limits of a barman using a suite of characteristics. It has organisms that share all the continuity among themselves and are completely discontinuous with all other organisms. 
And that is the original kind. Okay, so we already heard Todd talk about continuity in the context of the cat kind example. Let's remember that word discontinuity for later. This definition is obviously fuzzy to the extreme and totally ad hoc, but I give Todd credit for at least attempting it. It appears as if all of these different species are coming from a really elaborate <laughs> design. Oh, absolutely. And it's not just a design like God, you know, designed and created the lion. It's God created something that could make a lion. Mm -hmm. So it's more like, you know, a multi-tool or a Swiss Army knife where you got all these pieces that you can just pop out whenever you need them, but it's all just one thing. Big cats are one thing, but Dell wanted to know about humans. So they went to the gorilla cage and Todd showed his reverence for history and science by pulling priceless hominid skulls out of his flimsy blue backpack. Ooh, a skull. So this guy is a Neanderthal, very, very low forehead. So we have really tall foreheads, mm -hmm. but at the same time, well, it looks very human. We have others that are very different. Australopithecus africanus. The species of the famous Lucy fossil. What do you do with this stuff? I mean, there's many more that we could show, many more pictures, many more skulls, and you can see looking sure. at the, looking yeah. at them together, they're really, mm -hmm. there's a lot of difference there. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. So all that created kind stuff that we already talked about, I can show that I can find a discontinuity between humans and non-humans. There's that discontinuity word again. So this thing lands on the human side. This Neanderthal here, it's one of us. This thing is not. Mm. It is different. But this would be just another one of those varieties of living things that God made mm. in the beginning and that survived the flood aboard the ark. Yeesh, I'd never actually thought of hominids like Lucy being aboard the ark. Why is that extra disturbing? Todd's paper on the modern Behrman concept defines discontinuity as a significant holistic difference between two organisms. And here I was worried it might be vague or arbitrary. All we see are variations that happen within a created kind. Mm -hmm. so there's a felid tree which has all the cats on it. There's the canid tree which has all the dogs on it. There's the ursid tree which has all the bears on it. There's the equid tree with all the horses on it. Each individual created kind then has its own individual tree so that you end up with something like an orchard or a forest. All right, so the identification of created kinds involves grouping with obvious similarities and separating by obvious differences, and the premise that God pre-programmed all the variation potential into the original pairs of each kind. Now, if you might indulge me for a minute for an honest question about this process, could we consider the extinct meacids, which had features and protosimilarities to the dogs, cats, and bears? Is it possible that instead of these kinds shown, God made a meacid kind? and that he pre-programmed the variations of dogs, cats, and bears into the one pair of meacids on the ark? Is this any different a claim? It's possible, right? And if it's possible there was a meacid kind that included dogs, cats, and bears, is it possible there was just a mammal kind? That God made a single pair of mammals that he pre-programmed with all the variations to become dogs and cats and bears and mice and rabbits and horses? Surely God could have just as easily done that too, right? Not impossible for a designer God. Well, what if on day six, God made just a single pair of land-dwelling animals, but in them had pre-programmed all the genetic potential to specialize into reptiles, amphibians, and mammals? Or maybe God made just a single cell of life that he pre-programmed with all the diversity to become plants and animals. That'd be possible for God, right? And aligned with all the available physical evidence? I think we've all just become theistic evolutionists. Well, Todd, that's kind of fascinating now to think about what God was doing when he was bringing... Uh, two of every kind. What do you think was going on there? Ah, yes, Noah's Ark. The obvious question of how could millions of species of land animals fit on the Ark is the only reason this Behrman idea exists in the first place. He doesn't have to bring every little variety onto the Ark. Mm -hmm. So when you actually do the calculations, and okay, so we don't know exactly how many created kinds there were on the Ark, but maybe a couple thousands, and they're small. Most animals are quite small, so you have room to spare, literally room to spare. Mm. And all of that diversity that we have today is built into those two of every kind. So 7,000 pairs became all the species we know today. The velocity of this diversity is something Bill Nye addressed in his debate with Ken Ham. Let's see, if there are 4,000 years since Ken Ham's flood, and let's say, as he said many times, there are 7,000 kinds Today, so we'll take a number which uh, I think is pretty reasonable, 16 million species today. If these came from 7,000 kinds, that's, let's say we have uh, 7,000 subtracted from 15 million, that's 15,993. We have 4,000 years, we have 365 and a quarter days a year. 
we would expect to find 11 new species every day. So you'd go out into your yard, you wouldn't just find a different bird, a new bird, you'd find a different kind of bird, a whole new species, a bird, every day, a new species of fish, a new species of organisms you can't see, and so on. I mean, this would be enormous news. The last 4,000 years, people would have seen these changes among us, but we see no evidence of that. There's no evidence of these species. There just simply isn't enough time. But in another interview, Todd points out that the velocity problem is far worse than even Bill presents. How is it that they're able to come about so fast? Why is it that very soon after the flood, Noah, uh, not Noah, but uh, Abraham uh, is owning cattle and donkeys and camels? Those are modern species, modern domesticated species, and yet he's got them within 400 years of the flood. That's an amazing, that's an amazing rate of production of species. Uh, and my suspicion is that there's an initial burst and an, a burst of speciation, a burst of new species, and then it sort of dies off after that. And we need to understand how that is. See, this velocity problem doesn't bother Todd at all, even at a rate of 110 new species per day. He leans right into it, disregarding gestation periods and litter sizes. Such a proposed species explosion would obviously require supernatural intervention, so there's no reason for any physical restraints to apply. How does the standard story, the conventional paradigm, explain all of that? Well, they would use evolution, right? So millions of years, random variations. We all go back to a common ancestor that lived billions of years ago. And through the process of mutation and genetic variation uh, and natural selection, that's where we get the stuff that we have today. And that's exactly what we observe. I'm sorry. Did you just admit that evolution from common descent is exactly what we observe? Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, natural selection and random variation can do amazing things. I mean, it, it's pretty astonishing. You acknowledge mutation and natural selection, Todd? And that was a remarkably coherent description of evolution for a young Earth presentation. Are you sure you're in the right film? Created kinds with bunnies. And so two of those go on the ark. The rest of them are destroyed in the flood. And then, of course, God says again to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so there are now bunnies reproducing again. And guess what? As they do that, there's some varieties of bunnies that are generated at that point. All 54 things that we call species today would have come from two bunnies that lived and survived the flood aboard Noah's Ark. Now, you might be thinking, hey, that sounds a lot like evolution, right? I mean, they're all evolving from a common ancestor. So isn't that just evolution? Maybe Todd's personal blog will shed some light. Here we go, Todd's blog and the truth about evolution. Let's see what he says. Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It is not teetering on the verge of collapse. It has not failed as a scientific explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it. It is not just speculation or a faith choice or an assumption or a religion. It is a productive framework for lots of biological research and it has amazing explanatory power. There is no conspiracy to hide the truth about the failure of evolution. There has really been no failure of evolution as a scientific theory. It works, and it works well. I'm confused, Todd. If evolution is such successful science, why all of this created kinds business? Again, from Todd's personal blog, it is my own faith choice to reject evolution because I believe the Bible reveals true information about the history of the earth that is fundamentally incompatible with evolution. I am motivated to understand God's creation from what I believe to be a biblical creationist perspective. Evolution itself is not flawed or without evidence. Please don't be duped into thinking that somehow evolution itself is a failure. Faith is enough. If God said it, that should settle it. Maybe that's not enough for your scoffing professor or your non-Christian friends, but it should be enough for you. So, as we once again ask, is Genesis History Science, the very expert Dell puts on screen, says no. No, it's not science. In Todd's expert opinion, evolution has the evidence, and the Genesis position is arrived at only by faith. If the man on screen says it so clearly, what else is left for me to add? Is Genesis History Science continues with part 10, hosted by SciStrike on his channel. Tap on the video image to continue there now, or find a link in the description. And before you go, please subscribe to Apologia to make sure you're notified of future episodes. Later.